Hey guys, it's your boy Ferris, and welcome to the first in my series of great planners with great ideas and applying their great ideas to City Skylines series. And as I mentioned before, we're starting with Frederick Law Olmsted, the father of modern landscape architecture and one of the most well-known planners in all of American history. A lot of his projects, even if you're not from this country or never even visited the United States, you've heard of and probably seen pictures of his projects. He was mostly known for his work in designing parks and is responsible for some of the most beautiful and popular parkland areas in all of the United States, including the Capitol and White House area in Washington, D.C., Central Park in New York City, which he designed with his landscape architect partner, a guy named Calvert Vaugh, Niagara Falls State Park in, uh, in upstate New York on the border with Canada, which we'll come back to in a moment, and Boston's so-called Emerald Necklace. Now, I wanted to talk about this for a second. The Emerald Necklace is named because there are a number of larger green space areas along this linked area around the city. It starts down here with Boston Common, which then gets connected through the Back Bay area here to the Fens, and Fenway Park is right about here. And then up through this area into Jamaica Plain, up here, and over to the Arnold Arboretum, which today is still operating and run by Harvard University down here to Franklin Park and Franklin Park Zoo, which is the largest park in uh, the Boston area. So the reason this is called the Emerald Necklace is because this C shape frames the peninsula that makes up downtown Boston with the Charles River to its north and, and Boston Harbor around the other two sides of it. But also what's interesting about this is that all these spaces are linked. I mean, you can stay in parkland and have this entire journey through the Boston area. So that's one of the things that's really unique and interesting and an idea that Olmsted brought to the front is connecting and linking up your parks and your green spaces to create this sort of interconnected natural beauty within an urban area. He also did some town designs. This is a plan he did uh, with Calvert Vaugh for the town of Riverside, Illinois, which is just outside of Chicago. And this was actually built, and you can go on to Google Earth or Google Maps or whatever your preferred map uh, internet dealer is and take a look at how this ended up getting built. But that's Riverside, which we'll also come back to in a moment. This one here, the town of Vandergrift in Pennsylvania, which was commissioned, uh, the plan was commissioned by the Apollo Iron and Steel Company, which acquired all of this land and wanted to build a neighborhood for the employees that they were going to be bringing into work at this steel plant down here. So that task of designing the neighborhood for all these workers went to Olmsted and Vaughn, and that's what they came up with. And this one here I also really like, even though it's a lot smaller in scope than the other two plants, Pinehurst, North Carolina, the little village area of Pinehurst, North Carolina. And the color to this was added in a little bit later by somebody else, because Olmsted's original plan didn't have the color, but it's important, I think, to show how much green space and how much tree growth he really wanted, even in his town design plans for a fairly densely populated area. So he was also known for doing a number of academic campuses, including the University of California at Berkeley, Tufts University here in Medford, Massachusetts, Cornell University in New York, and this is his plan for Stanford University out in Palo Alto, California. Now this was done with an architectural firm who designed these buildings and plopped the buildings into Olmsted's layout. So that's why this plan looks a little different. It looks more like a design plan rather than just a, a plot layout and streetscape and whatever else for the actual campus. But this is his plan for the campus layout with the architect's drawings for the actual buildings on the campus plopped in. And it's it's gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. So Olmsted was prolific. There are hundreds and hundreds of projects to his credit, including hundreds more to his firm's name, which was carried on after his death in 1903 by his two sons, John Charles Olmsted, who he adopted, and his natural-born son, Frederick Law Jr. So the question becomes, with all this work to his credit, what can we take away and apply 
to City Skylines. And I thought about this a lot because there's so much of his work to look at. And I came up with two things. First of all, let's talk about park design. Because we all put parks in our cities. And how do you go about designing parks? And what kinds of things can you do to make them a little bit different? Well, this is Olmsted's design for Prospect Park in Brooklyn, New York. Which also did get built. And we're going to take a look at the overhead in just a second. But there's so many typical features of Olmsted's work in this park. For example, the paths. The walking paths are winding, curved, gently curved paths with strange connections. They do not travel in straight lines. They do not intersect at 90 degree angles. They are weaving, they are wandering, they are meandering. And I think that's what Olmsted wanted. He was a lover of nature and wanted to provide the urban dweller with an opportunity to escape the built urban environment and feel connected to nature. So we've got these sort of walks that take the traveler off of the urban environment and almost feel like it's a a hike without much direction at all. There's also lots of these strange little connections. There's always a new path for someone who frequents this park to find. There's always a new area, a new way to go and without feeling like you're about to get lost. So that's something to keep in mind when designing parks. We don't want to necessarily give the traveler a beeline to get from this side of the park here at this entrance all the way over to this entrance in just a straight line. Make them work for it. We want our park travelers to, uh, our park visitors I should say, to feel a little bit connected to nature as they're going to the park and almost forget that they're in a city, which is something that people say a lot about Central Park in New York and to its credit. So that's number one. Secondly, he also respected as much as he loved tree growth. And if we take a look at the actual park here, see there's tons of thick tree growth in Prospect Park. And there is in Central Park as well, and a lot of Olmsted's parks. But he also respected the open, grassy areas. These had a lot of value for recreation, he realized. So you'll always see that as well. And Central Park has them, and a lot of other Olmsted parks too, will have these open grassy areas for recreation or for other things as well. And the last thing that I would say is a absolute benchmark of any Olmsted park. i got to flip back to our look at Niagara Falls Park. Now, this isn't a great angle to look at it, but one of the things that Olmsted always tried to do in his park was protect the scenic vista. Give the visitor to the park scenic views. So the elevations of this park are pretty drastic, going from here downhill this way to the water and downhill this way to the water. There's actually about a cliff that goes right about here along this tree line um, and another significant drop right in here along this. So this is a flat driving or walking path, I don't, I'm not really sure, out to this scenic area that overlooks the river and the falls. So if you can picture that and you can see the shadow over here, how drastic this is. This I, The idea of this and especially these paths along here were created so that the person walking these paths would have the perfect scenic vista of the river below and then over here being able to look at this part of the falls. But these paths up here as well, they were designed with the idea of still having those same scenic views because they're at a such higher elevation than these other paths below. So at every point in this park, wherever you are, he protected the scenic vista of the path that you're walking on. Taking into note the elevations and making sure that at each elevation there was something new to see. So that's another thing that's a sort of a benchmark of Olmsted's parks. In a lot of his parks you'll see observation towers or scenic vista points where he wants you to see something, some aspect of nature that you would not have otherwise seen if they didn't protect it in a certain way through the park. So park design, those are some good points uh, that we can learn from Olmsted. The second thing I think we can take away from has to do with street design. You can see his streets are very odd. We're not talking about a grid here at all. But I think maybe the best way to show you how this can apply to city skylines is to go ahead and jump into a time lapse and show you how I put together a very Olmsted-esque 
streetscape and talk about what it's for, what it's used for, why it might work in your city. So let's take a look at that. So my take on an Olmsted streetscape in city skylines is going to look a little bit of something like this. Gently curving streets, minimizing the intersections. And part of the problem with the grid is that it creates so many intersections and they all have to be regulated. So with Olmsted streetscapes, and if you look back at Riverside and at Vandergrift, he's creating a lot of two-way intersections, three-way intersections, and not necessarily where they have to be completely regulated. At 90 degrees, you have to stop. But with a lot of these, the angles intersect. Some of the streets are just connecting right onto the right onto another one, almost makes sort of like a modified T intersection, like the one that I just drew there. Creating those modified T's means that one side of the traffic can have priority and keep moving straight without stopping, and the other side has to stop and wait till they get their turn. Now, the, one of the things that the grid is great at is that the car wants to go fast and straight directly from point A to point B without stopping or slowing down, which was great for traffic flow, but it's terrible for pedestrians and for other things. Olmsted used these gently curving streets with a tree line as sort of a traffic calming measure, as a way to slow people down. And it worked because the driver doesn't feel as confident about what's around the bend if it's not a straight path and you can see directly in front of you for a long way. If it's a curve, you tend to just naturally slow down. And if it's tree-lined, it takes away some of the ability to see what's coming up, so you also naturally slow down. So these are a traffic calming measure, but he also, of course, loves trees and he loves green, so that's just a bonus. It's a win-win. So these Odd intersections, very rarely at 90 degrees, also serve as a traffic calming measure because at a, at a four-way intersection at 90 degrees, you can see exactly what's going on. But when you're connecting onto an intersection where it's not at 90 degrees, the views are harder to get and you naturally approach that intersection a little bit more timidly. So this was my take on it here. I don't know if this type of a streetscape works well for like an urban downtown but for a suburban style residential neighborhood, I just think this streetscape that you have here, this layout is so interesting and will work so well for that. I really encourage some of the city skyline builders to try to create that, this type of a streetscape instead of sticking with the grid. Okay guys, just a quick recap on what I think you can take from Frederick Law Olmsted for city skylines. First of all, park design. Link your green spaces, connect them together to make one larger parkland area that makes that gives your city dwellers a chance for a little bit of connection with nature. Limit the entry and exit points on your parks. If you have an entry and exit all the way around, then it sort of doesn't feel like a special place to enter and get out of. It also makes it feel more like a getaway. Gently winding paths, having those direct connections at 90 degrees, Zipping from one side of the park to the other doesn't give you the escape that somebody like Frederick Law Olmsted would want the urban dwellers to have. Utilizing both tree growth and open grassy areas and maximizing scenic views utilizing the elevations. So if you have a park that's on the side of a hill, definitely take advantage of that. Make sure your paths are connected but also going along those elevations so that people on those higher elevation paths have something really special to look at. Secondly, street layout and design. Utilize gently curving tree lined streets which rarely intersect at 90 degrees and they create rounded polygons of development. And If you take a look especially at the riverside plan you see sort of these rounded ovals with plots in them for development. Again, the idea is to have those gently curving traffic calming measures in place around those residential development areas. I hope you've enjoyed this look into Frederick Law Olmsted. I hope this gives you some cool ideas and ways to apply some of what he did to city skylines. If so, please drop me a note. Please drop me a comment. Find me on the Facebook Mayor's Guild page and let me know how your application of Frederick Law Olmsted turned out. I will have another planner to present to you in a couple weeks. In the meantime, Thanks again. My name is Ferris, and I'll see you then. Take care of each other. Bye-bye.